Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, or as we say in Persian, Khoshunadi. Today's panel is on Kiarostami, Imagination and Existence in Film. My name is Jonan, and I'm a student at Georgetown University and part of the Persian Studies program. I will be assisting with the Q&A portion, and if at any time you like to pose a question, please use the Q&A function so that we may address the questions during our designated Q&A portion. As always, questions are welcome in many languages, including English, Persian, as well as in German. Today's webinar is part of a series of events hosted by the Persian Studies Program, but it's our very first event on the cinema of law. This is especially an important topic to a Persian studies program since we offer a course on the cinema of Iran as part of the Persian studies program. I had the chance to be in the cinema course myself and learn about Kiara Rostami. And I even remember the very first movie I watched by him, Where's the Friend's Home? It remains one of the most memorable movies I've seen and I look forward to further learning about Kiarostami from our esteemed panel that we have today. But before that, I want to use this opportunity to express my gratitude to the Jolinus family for making this event possible, as well as to Professor Mustafi, whom I have the honor of introducing now. Professor Mustafi is the founder and director of the Persian Studies Program at Georgetown University. Professor Mustafi, I will hand it over to you now for your opening remarks. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our attendees from around the world. On behalf of the Persian Studies Program at Georgetown University, I would like to welcome you to Kiarostami, Imagination and Existence in Film which is part of our Jolly News Lecture Series. We greatly appreciate your attendance today and your continued interest in our cultural events. I would also like to extend my gratitude to Shahzad and Farhad Jolly News, without whom these cultural events would not be possible. Allow me also to thank Mr. Ahmad Kiarostami for his help in today's event. I now have the pleasure of introducing our panelists, Mr. Godfrey Cheshire, Dr. Jean-Michel Frodon, Dr. Mehraz uh, Said Wafa, and our moderator, Dr. Richard Pena. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, my own kind of history with Kiarostami is part of really my own personal discovery of Iranian cinema back in the late 1980s. In 1988, I began working for the Film Society at Lincoln Center. And one of the programs that the Film Society still puts on is a program called New Directors, New Films. And I can remember in fall of 1988, receiving a box from something called the Farabi Cinema Foundation in Tehran. Uh, and it had you know, a whole box of VHS tapes with a note saying, we'd really love you to consider these films for your festival. So one evening, I just sort of figured I'll try and get through as many as I can. And I was really awestruck. I had known a little bit about Iranian cinema. I had seen a couple of the 1970s so-called Iranian New Wave films, but nothing prepared me for what I saw as a really exciting and different new cinema uh, from a place where, frankly, I hadn't expected to see such work. So that began a kind of romance between the Film Society and Iranian cinema. Over the years, we had the chance to do several large series, retrospectives, and of course, to include Iranian films in both new directors, new films, and in the New York Film Festival. And there was nobody who was more important to us in a kind of personal or I think professional sense than Abbas Kiarostami. Uh, we had the chance to include his films, just about all his films in the festival during my 25 years there. Uh, and he was always a most welcome guest. On a personal level, I got to spend time with him in New York, in Paris, uh, all 
also in Tehran. And he was really an extraordinary human being. Uh, one so who really in many ways looks like his films, meaning that the kind of wisdom, the kind of humanity, um, the kind of patience that I think you, one finds in his films, one also found in the person. So I know my co-panelists all have extensive experience with him as well, so I'm looking forward to hearing their thoughts. Let me just end by saying one of the taglines that this webinar used in its uh, poster for the event was a quote from Jean-Luc Godard, in which he said, the history of cinema begins with D.W. Griffith and ends with Kurosami. And I think for many years, you know, I thought that was a typically kind of a little bit outrageous kind of statement by Godard, who's prone for outrageous statements. But then in the last few days, I began thinking about what that meant. And I began to think, again, uh, as so often, Godard has an incredibly interesting way of looking at cinema. And if Griffith was the filmmaker who, you know, in a certain way, uh, unjustly attributed to sort of creating montage editing, that is the piecing together of short bits of films to create a world, perhaps Kiarostami was that director who brought us back to that world. Rather than a world created, we now had a world experienced, a world observed, a world lived. And perhaps that's what John Luke was trying to get in that kind of uh, interesting statement. But again, I'll look forward to hearing from my uh, friends and co-panelists today on all this. Uh, let me introduce everybody. I've got these little, little bios here, although I frankly don't need them too much since I do know them well. Uh, the first is Jean-Michel Fredon. Uh, Jean-Michel was the editor of Cahiers de Cinema and for a long time also the critic for Le Monde. He has also taught at Sciences Po, Sciences Politique in Paris for many years. He's also a curator who's put together series on a wide variety of subjects, uh, from Iran, series on Jafar Panahi, Amir Naderi, and coming up at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, a series on the other French New Wave, kind of the lesser known figures from the French New Wave. He's of course also published extensively on many subjects, including Iranian cinema, uh, including in 2020, a book called Abbas Kiristami, The Open Work, which he co-wrote with Agnes de Victor. So we're delighted to have him here today. Uh, we also have on the panel, Mirnaz, let me just make sure I get the name correct, because I usually just call her Mirnaz, Mirnaz Saeed Vafa. Uh, Mirnaz is a filmmaker and also a professor at Columbia College in Chicago. Uh, together with Jonathan Rosenbaum, I think she wrote the first English language book that was dedicated exclusively to Abbas Kiarostami way back in 2003. And it's since been updated to include the films that appeared after that. She's written extensively on Iranian cinema and many different topics and has been a consultant for many film festivals, uh, including a festival which she founded in Chicago that's held at the Gene Sisko Film Center, which is dedicated to Iranian cinema. And last but not least is my old friend Gottfried Cheshire from New York. Uh, Gottfried is a New York-based filmmaker and also film critic who back in the early 90s, or perhaps even a little before that, was one of the people who not only helped to discover Iranian cinema, but was one of the first to truly write in an insightful way about it, to really show what was so interesting and important about this new wave, again, coming from a place that few of us really suspected would become such an important part of international cinema. Uh, his book, Conversations with Kia Rastami, has been translated into Farsi, and of course is available in English as well, and he has coming up another book called In the Time of Kia Rastami, Writings on Iranian Cinema. So that last title gives me a good intro into what I was hoping to begin with. Um, can we talk about Iranian cinema in the time of Kiarostami? So often in international cinema, one figure leaps to the front and we tend to look at the cinema from his or her perspective. In a certain way, it almost comes from that. What can you say about the impact of Abbas Kiarostami on contemporary Iranian cinema, contemporary beginning, say, in the 1980s up until today? And Jean-Michel, may I begin with you? Thank you, thank you, Richard. And I would like to 
say hello to, to everyone and to thank very much Professor Mostofi for uh, this uh, invitation and also salute my colleagues uh, here on the, on the panel. Um, well, first and foremost, uh, I believe one should say that uh, what happened with and thanks to Basquiat Rostami was to bring Iranian cinema into a much uh, a significant light, uh, international light, uh, which mostly means Western uh, to the Western world, but not only uh, because uh, step by step it also spread to Asia and uh, there was a lot of attention to uh, Karostami's cinema in, in Asia and to uh, Middle East and African uh, and, uh, and the rest of the world so far because uh, he embodied uh, several things at the same time. He definitely uh, was the, uh, the, in French we say the sparrow which announces the spring, uh, the, 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 the character who comes first and, and tells that something new is happening. Something new was happening. Uh, and actually, as you, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Richard, it was happening in Iran, uh, the so-called uh, Iranian uh, new cinema or new wave uh, since the late 60s uh, and during the, all the, the 70s. And Karostami was already part of it. Uh, at this time, because he started to direct in his first short film was directed in, in 1969, uh, Bread and the Alley. But um, we, generally speaking, uh, didn't know about it. Uh, we didn't care about that, which is uh, our fault because uh, we are narrow uh, sighted uh, very often and we pay more attention to, to Western. Uh, filmmaking than the rest of the, of the world, especially in those years, in those decades. Uh, and Karostami was important and was really a, a breakthrough character, thanks to uh, the visibility of uh, Where is My Friend's Home, uh, which was discovered abroad at the end of the 80s, that something was happening. And then uh, around that, he both uh, open attention to Iranian cinema beyond himself. And then we start with the festival goers, with the cinephiles, we who pay attention to what's happening in the cinema planet <coughs> at large, started to discover other Iranian filmmakers with the bias uh, that we compare with the first one we have came to know which is at the same time inevitable and a arguable because uh, not everybody should be compared to someone, whoever he is, and <laughs> even if he's a genius, which is what Charles Tammy is, but he also opened attention to um, a larger uh, scope of, 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 uh, of filmmaking all over the world and Abbas Kiarostami is probably the director who helped the most as an individual filmmaker to uh, open uh, the world cinema, uh, Chinese cinema, uh, uh, Latin American cinema, African cinema, uh, to bring it on the, on the scene, Korean cinema, Thai cinema, etc., uh, to, 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 to bring it on the international scene. So he, his role is really uh, decisive uh, during the last decades of the 20th century. Uh, in the sense of our knowledge of, of, of cinema at large, but he was uh, the most significant, uh, by far the most significant uh, director, artist of a certain kind of filmmaking, which of obviously was not all Iranian cinema, other Iranian directors were making films before at the same time, and of course still uh, since. Uh, 
and it would be uh, stupid to 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 like uh, <laughs> understand Iranian cinema only through Kiarostami. Uh, Kiarostami uh, has his own way of making films. He had followers, good follow. I would say good followers, for good reason that shared with him this idea of cinema. There are none of them is at the quality at the level of uh, his his work and also for not so good reason because he was successful and recognized abroad so there were imitations of his work which uh, came to to appear as a pretty fake uh, or uh, over, over overrated at, at, at a certain moment so there is still a lot of uh, 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 work to do to uh, define what was specific in Kiarostami's uh, in Kiarostami's filmmaking, what was uh, significant for a certain trend inside Iranian cinema, and what inside Iranian cinema is, is uh, even uh, very, very meaningful and interesting, though very different from Kiarostami's work. Thank you, Mirnaz. Can I ask you to respond to that as well? Kiarostami's place in Iranian cinema of well, since the beginning of the, uh, at least the beginning of the 90s. The beginning of 90s, oh, sure. Yeah, we'll talk um, early, later about the early years. Sure, uh, 90s for, you know, 90s and, you know, the decade after 90s, Iranian cinema was Kyrgyzstan. He just, you know, dominated the whole uh, scene. Um, uh, but what's important is that, you know, to know about Kiarostami is that when he was discovered in the West, he was already established as a filmmaker in Iran, had made 20 films, short and medium length and long features, already confident in his place, already had done a lot of, you know, uh, play with uh, you know, uh, the tools of cinema, the language of his cinema. Uh, but I also want like, you know, uh, Richard, you know, you talked a little bit about your, uh, connection with the getting to know, meeting Kiarostami. I met Kiarostami uh, when he screened his film 1977 report uh, in the Farabi Cinema Club. That's my, my first uh, you know, sort of uh, encounter with him and his cinema. Uh, although, you know, at that time, uh, the, his shorts, uh, we were you know, among the people, cinephiles in Iran. Uh, there were talks about his short that was very, you know, uh, important. Uh, but just like, you know, uh, the West probably for a long time, as uh, Jean-Michel mentioned, uh, he also was kind of a little bit under shadow of, you know, the art house filmmakers and commercial cinema. It, takes, it took a while before, you know, it really, you know, they started really paying uh, attention to him. Uh, and the reason why is that he was a you know employee of a state uh, organization, Kanun, in the Center for uh, uh, the, uh, Intellectual Development of Children and Young Adults, uh, which was founded by Shah's wife in 1965. And then 1969, they decided to have a film chapter to make educational film for uh, you know uh, children. So uh, because you know Kiarostami had already before becoming a filmmaker. He had already done a lot of, as a graphic designer, he had already done a lot of uh, design for a title sequence of a lot of commercial films. And he had already done, you know, 150, more than 150 commercials. He had uh, illustrated many children books. Uh, you know, he, you know that he's a multidisciplinary artist, you know, uh, later on, you know, he did all sorts of, uh, you know, exhibition in different galleries, you know, in his photographs and uh, his uh, installation, video installation, um, you know, that, you know, he was a uh, poet uh, and uh, illustrator, but by uh, uh, training, he studied fine arts and graphic design. So because of that background, you know, Shi Wanlu, who was a friend, you know, invited him to come to uh, Kanun. And um, so, you know, his film, you know, uh, 1969, 1970, The uh, Bread and Ali, you know, he started, you know, sort of uh, making films uh, uh, for children and uh, without any pressure for, you know, making profit in the commercial cinema or artistic expectation on him as an art house filmmaker. So he, he really gave himself a lot of freedom to, you know, do whatever he felt like and play with 
and learn his, you know, uh, what he uh, appealed to him uh, from cinema. And he had you know, a lot of stories in terms of how he, you know, did not want to really uh, cut, uh, for example, Brenda and Ali, he did not want to put the camera in several different angles to, you know, make an exciting, uh, you know, story with the, this little boy and the dog. So, you know, he, he, you know, he went with his intuition and, you know, uh, uh, in fact, you know, some of the very profound film that he made was those childlike, you know, uh, uh, experimental films uh, that he uh, made at Kanun that I hope that, you know, uh, it will come back, it will, you know, come to United States, uh, orderly and disorderly, 1981. It's a really profound film. Uh, uh, that he, you know, he made, and uh, also, you know, case number one, number two, 1979, at the time that, oh, uh, because of revolution and the cinema came almost to a standstill, there was a lot of scrutiny, a lot of, uh, you know, black uh, listed, uh, you know, filmmakers, uh, filmmakers, you know, that, you know, uh, some were uh, in prison, some were just stopped uh, making films, and some left the country. But Kiarostami stayed, and you know he you know made that film. Case number one, number two, that was banned uh, for a long, long time, and you know I unfortunately didn't. Time and noticed that how important it, it is, and I will talk about maybe later on in a different context. But what I'm saying is that you know those uh, short films that he made at Kanun was absolutely some of them were absolutely very profound in terms of format, in terms of you know. Uh, how he's, you know, playing with the audience and expectation, etc. Uh, so with report, he really, you know, became very important. But his major, major influence was 1990 with Close Up. The film Close Up just changed the whole direction of the history of cinema in Iran. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, uh, influence of Kiarostami on other younger filmmakers to sort of, you know, pay attention to uh, what. Can, uh, cinema can do, and also because of his, uh, you know, uh, you know, suddenly he was, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, discovered in the West, and he became sort of festival director, as they said to him. Uh, so, you know, uh, he, he became a, a extremely important. But as uh, Jean Michel said, he was also already important as a part of the Iranian New Age cinema that you have, you know. Uh, Merjuri and Bezai, Naderi, you know, Shirdel, and you know, all sorts of people, you know. Uh, and, you know, of course, you know, one has to also mention that when we talk about, you know, new wave, Iranian new wave cinema and uh, who started it, who were the pioneers and all that, there are a lot of, of course, important filmmakers. Two things I want to bring out, you know, the, uh, uh, here. One is that, you know, 1962, a short film by uh, the poet. Farouk Farouk The House is Black, really was uh, controversial and revolutionary and radical in terms of what a documentary and slash uh, uh, reenacted documentary, meaning fiction documentary, can do. And so it, the form as well as the subject. Another thing about Kiarostami is that, you know, there is a scene uh, 1973 by, you know, Iranian Godar Parviz Kimiavi called uh, The Mongols. Towards the end of the film, this group of you know um, um, Mughal, Mughals or you know Mughals looking you know characters, men, uh, they are lost in the desert and they find them you know, a gate uh, that there is no wall attached to gate, but there is a gate, and they press the gate. They were asking for the director, what is this film about? You know why we are you know wandering in this desert, and you know uh, the famous uh, uh, question of uh, Bazan comes up. You know. What is cinema? The, the, the guy who rings the bell says, what is cinema? I think that's a very important you know, question that you know, a lot of different filmmakers in Iranian new wave try to respond to. What is cinema in Iran? What can be a cinema uh, that, is, has that, that captures the spirit of Iranian, which is for the most part poetry, and also the whole spirituality, the whole history and culture and everything. How can we make it our own you know, cinema? And I like to talk about that, how Kiarostami played a major role, of course, alongside with so many other uh, uh, new wave filmmakers, but uh, way more uh, uh, in terms of uh, reinventing cinema uh, in what is what cinema can be in Iran. Thank you, Rina. So I'll be going back to a lot of your points. You brought up so many good ones in your talk. Godfrey, can I turn to you now, please, to talk about that idea of the title of your book, uh, Cinema in the Time of Kiarostami. 
Uh, yes, Richard, I uh, <clears throat> started to, I, I had the idea that I wanted to finish this book and put it out after Kiarostami died. Uh, and it really struck me at that point that an era ended when he died. I mean, he dominated the, previ the previous era, uh, namely the post-revolutionary period up until his death uh, very decisively in terms of at least the way the world saw Iranian cinema. Uh, he, was, he was sort of the leading figure as we've sort of already alluded to. But, you know, one of my things has always been, uh, especially since I started going to Iran in the late 90s, I really saw that he was uh, there not regarded as, as this giant looming over everybody else. He was regarded as one of a bunch of important filmmakers or quite a number of them. And I, I always wanted to say that he uh, is best understood coming from this context rather than seeing being seen as some you know, transnational super auteur. He was really definitely an Iranian filmmaker, an Iranian artist throughout his career. And so when I, when I went to put together the book, I wanted it to, to be not just about him, but about the context that he came out of and the, uh, the Iranian cinema that happened during that time. So I've assembled a, a number of my articles and written a, a bunch of new ones to go to try to show this spectrum. He's at the center of it, but there are also sorts of other uh, interesting and important directors that are around him. I had a, a similar experience to you, Richard, and in fact, owed to you when uh, you, you had this discovery opening a box of VHS tapes in uh, the late 80s, as you described. My big revelation came at this uh, festival of Iranian uh, cinema, the first one post-revolutionary film in New York that you organized and staged at the Walter Reed Theater, which had just opened at that time in late 1992. And I was asked by the editor of Film Comment if I'd go see if it was worth an article. And I thought, oh gosh, it probably won't be worth an article. Who, who knows anything's going on in Iran? Uh, I, I thought that maybe I could say, well, it's not so, so much worth an article. How about an article about this French filmmaker or something? But I went and I was just really blown away by the films I saw and so many really fascinating films and really distinctive directorial visions. It certainly wasn't just one or two. I will say that of all the, the films that I saw, um, the one that knocked me out the most was Close Up. And I, and I wrote about that. When I wrote for Film Comment, that was the film I started talking about. And that has remained, I think, one of maybe his greatest film to me. But um, I do think, as uh, Marinaz was uh, suggesting, that that was a decisive film in what happened with Iranian cinema. But um, I know that it wasn't that well received in Iran when it premiered in 1992. And Kiristami told me that people were trying to figure out what he was trying to say about Makhmalbaf, and he wasn't really interested in Makhmalbaf. Makhmalbaf was just a sort of a, a tool in this, in this discourse that had to do with cinema. He was much more interested in Hossein Sabjian, the, the guy that was so obsessed with cinema. So, but I do think that, and it's interesting that not only was it not well received in Iran initially, um, but it also was passed over by most of the world's major film festivals, including New York and including Cannes and everything. It went to a couple of sort of third tier festivals. But I think that once critics began seeing it, once it got to circulate, and uh, I think perhaps especially in France, its you know uh, reputation just grew and grew and grew and people saw, saw it for what uh, it became, eventually became seen as, is this really the, uh, agenda changing masterpiece. And that helped get Kiarostami, I think, uh, chosen to be uh, in the uh, one of the main sections of the Cannes Film Festival in 1992 with And Life Goes On. And then from there, he went up the ladder to uh, Through the Olive Trees in an official uh, competition and then won the Palme d'Or for um, uh, Taste of Cherry in 1997. So he had this very, very rapid ascent um, that uh, when I went to Iran in 1997, that was my first time, um, and met him. I, I actually met him first in uh, New York when he was there in 1994 with Through the Olive Trees. And we just hit it off. And I was very glad to you know, start building a friendship with him at that time and continuing when I went to Iran for uh, uh, this festival, the Fadj Festival in 1997. And when I was there, it was really, I learned a whole lot about uh, the context that I keep speaking of, uh, of Iranian cinema and what their their cinema scene is like there and how various critics and filmmakers and uh, audience members think of the, you know, the, the works that are coming out of Iran. And I saw at that time that 
Uh, a, a lot of Iranians were kind of puzzled that Kiristami was had been sort of rapidly elevated above uh, the other directors, since a lot of people thought that he was maybe not on the level of Merjui or Bezayi or whatever. That that uh, that opinion gradually changed, but it was very interesting to me to see that he was regarded, at, you know, in Cannes as one thing, and in Iran as another thing, and in the U.S. maybe as another thing. That was actually the subject of really the first film, the first article I wrote just about him for Film Comment, which was the first article they had about Kiristami. I called it a cinema of questions and the questions that he sort of poses in all these different settings that have been viewing him and receiving him and becoming more and more interested in him. Um, but I do think that, uh, you know, going back to what Mernaz says, you know, he did have this very, very significant part of his uh, whole career in um, uh, Iran before the world began to learn about him. The world began to learn about him with um, really the success at the Locarno Film Festival of Where's the Friend's House. And then he went on through Cannes and all these other things. But uh, before that, there was 15 years uh, or more of, of films that he made in Iran that if we look back at them now are really, really fascinating uh, works on a lot of different levels. Um, he did work at Kanun where <clears throat> the, the mission of Kanun was to create things for young people, for children. But he always said he made films uh, with children, but not necessarily a, for children, right? He wasn't making children's films, although sometimes he did. But if you look at really the first four of his films, uh, the shorter films, starting with Bread and Alley, they're all in black and white, and they're like really little art films. I mean, I don't think he cared at all if, the, if children like these films. I mean, uh, it, it, they were all accessible enough that children could be interested, but he was sort of creating his own little film universe or film language in, in doing these things. And then, and I think that the freedom that he had there was really key to the way that he developed. I think that really, really helped him that he didn't have commercial or ideological pressures coming at him at that time. He was in his little own studio making these little films to, to please himself. And uh, since we brought up Kanun, I just wanted to point out that um, this past weekend in New York, uh, Ahmed Kiristami, I was his son, was here and he did a program about Kanun uh, with the lady who founded it, whose name is Lily Amir Arjama. And she, to my knowledge, has never done public events or interviews or anything like that, but she did this because Ahmad wanted her to. And it was one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen about Iranian cinema. It was like a two hour discussion. And Ahmad had gotten some clips. Uh, he'd asked some people to make short films to talk about her and to talk to her, including Amir Nadari, he was the first one. Of course, uh, Ahmad asked people for one or two minute films. And you know, if you know Amir, you know he can't talk for one or two minutes. It's gonna be 15 minutes at least. But the program is great and it's on YouTube now. So if you go to YouTube, you can watch this. It's uh, Ahmad Kiristami and uh, Lily uh, uh, Amir Arjaman talking about Kanu. And I highly recommend that. But I'll, I'll, I'll wrap, you know, wrap up my portion of the remarks right now by saying, you know, this is a great topic and I hope we can talk about all the phases of Kiristami's career, because it really was fascinating in the way it had evolved. Thank you all very much. You brought up so many points that I hope we can get to. I think we have to do a series of these uh, webinars. I think we can't get to everything today. Something that I wanted to ask you, because it's something that has uh, always been very important for me, but I've seen in recent years it's gotten less important, and that is sometimes situating a filmmaker within his or her culture. I find with younger students, there's a real tendency to not want to think of so-and-so as a Brazilian filmmaker or a Lebanese filmmaker, but you know, almost a, an exclusive concentration on the auteur aspect. But Kiarostami seems to me, and you all are much better to answer this than I am, someone who really springs from Iranian culture. And I would like you, if you would just think about that for a moment, talk about Abbas Kiarostami in terms of your own knowledge and experience of Iranian culture. Mirnaz, can I start with you? Oh, sure. Uh, I'd like to you know, mention that you know, uh, Iranian New Wave cinema, uh, the whole group of uh, filmmakers, whether they were educated in the West or they were uh, coming from theater or literature or whatnot, not uh, educated formally, they, uh, the majority of the film, 99%, were you know uh, political and kind of a political you know uh, response to the culture 
and the forced modernities of the Shah's time. So uh, the, the films of Kiarostami, the shorter films of Kiarostami, some of them uh, may be uh, referred to the idea of class, for example, in the suit for a wedding, uh, wedding suit. Uh, but the majority was sort of uh, about, you know, some, you know, rather smaller personal subject and not so much, you know, political issues. I think that was one thing that, you know, the audience, even after a revolution, uh, one of the few uh, filmmakers of the new wave who stayed in the country and continued to work, they were expecting uh, of uh, Kiarostami to make a you know, political uh, statement and make political films. And they were very, some of them were very upset that he still makes these, you know, a philosophical films, a very contemplative film, maybe a simple, well, simple on the surface, but complex in you know, the film. Uh, but they even some uh, critic called him, you know, safety match. You know, he's, you know, he's harmless. He doesn't, you know, do, do it. So they didn't know how to deal with him uh, after the revolution. Uh, but you know, uh, what is important uh, uh, to talk about? You know, him and Godfrey also talked about, you know, uh, his. Uh, growth in development of his language at Kanun is that uh, he also, I, I think, you know, because, you know, his training as a graphic designer and also him being a to very interested in poetry and being a poet himself, he always uh, strived uh, to come at a, you know, a language in, in his language in cinema that had that kind of sparse, uh, you know, uh, quality, sparse language in cinema. And, but also as his character, as you all have met him, he was a very, you know, a very, he had a huge, uh, you know, and very uh, uh, special sense of humor. Uh, his sense of humor that some of them, you know, goes back to, you know, uh, the mysticism that he was, you know, in so many of interviews with me, you know, he said that he is not religious, but he's a mystic, uh, you know, uh, mysticism of Rumi, for example. And in many of his later films, you know, even the title of some of his films, you know, there are so many. Uh, titles of, for example, you know, the Where is the Friend's House is a, a poet, the title of Sohrab uh, Sepehri's poetry, The Address, and Wind Will Carry Us, and the Furu Farrakhsad, and, you know, quotation from uh, Khayyam, you know, who was a very existentialist uh, poet. And so he, he really, you know, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, that, you know, not only him, but the majority of Iranian filmmakers, they wanted to arrive at a kind of language that is both poetic and political. But he sort of repressed that political aspect, although there are aspects of uh, you know, his political views in his film, meaning that the way that he captures the culture of his time, that is, you know, without saying much of, you know, without you know, really uh, underlining it, there are you know, political commentary that, and social commentary in most of his film, but and you know, not so uh, pronounced maybe as some of his other uh, filmmakers. And also the idea of you know, uh, class, for example, in most of his film, there is you know, uh, you know, a difference between the middle class and uh, the poor and the working and uh, the rural, uh, rural people from the rural areas. Uh, but you know, he's one of the few who really stress on the middle class uh, Tehranis or maybe just the urban middle class uh, life during Shah's time. So I'm talking about his period before the revolution and the kind of alienation that a lot of you know, people felt that what is this national identity of Iranian? Are we going to sort of catch, with the, catch up with the West or should we just uh, stick to our you know, tradition or whatever we call it, you know, our identity? So this question of identity was huge you know, during, you know, uh, before revolution. And so, you know, uh, Part of you know his work, which is you know before revolution, it talks about you know uh, some of the you know uh, those aspects of that you know, you know, inspiration of poetry, inspiration of the culture, dominant culture of Shah's time at the time, and then after revolution, of course, he continues, but he you know he sort of with every film he changes his direction and he reinvents himself. So I like to you know sort of uh, stop here so that uh, uh, let other people also respond to your question. But I also want to sort of uh, uh, point out that, you know, the way that he uh, uh, interacts with people, his sense of humor, as well as his really, his, uh, you know, his really 
And there's a dark side to him, you know. Uh, people say, you know, reflected in his dark glasses that he would wear. But, you know, very serious philosophical, you know, tone of his film together with his humor. One could relate that to some of the, you know, aspect of Iranian culture and poetry. And uh, uh, also some of the culture of his time and this period. Uh, after revolution, there are some other, you know, uh, colors that come to the, you know, uh, to his work. So I you know, want to start here. <laughs> Jean Michel, can I ask you to respond to what Mirna said? She made an interesting point about this balance between the poetry and politics. And very often people have asked me, well, what are Kiarostami's politics? And I've never really known what to say or wanted to necessarily say. How do you perhaps respond to that? And perhaps if you could bring that to think about Kiarostami in terms of a lot of other contemporary Iranian art, uh, which I know you know well, and painting and photography and, and other media like that. Um, well, about, about politics, uh, I, I would say that I, I believe there is a strong uh, political uh, conscience in the filmmaking of Charles Tami, and I would say there uh, since the beginning, and for me transcends this separation between uh, pre and post uh, revolution. And it has, it was important what Mena said about, uh, about um, there is a dark side uh, in uh, Abbas Kiaro's family because uh, probably because we, most of us, many of us discovered him with uh, Where is My Friend's Home, which is uh, not that nice actually, uh, because there are very tough uh, dimensions in it, but Ultimately, it ends pretty well. So it's it's so, but many of Carlos Tami's films do not end that well. Are actually pretty uh, dark. Uh, even the, the early films, the, the short films uh, for uh, for Canoon, uh, the recre uh, recreation. Uh, the second short film is a very. It's about loneliness, and it's it's not uh, turning well for the for the small boy. Experiments. Uh, uh, is the same, uh, the passenger, uh, Mosafer, uh, traveler, I'm not sure of the English, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is also uh, not, not exactly a happy ending uh, uh, story. So uh, th there is this uh, notion that the world is not fine or is not uh, nice or cool or whatever, and people have to struggle, and there is a lot of struggle and struggling inside uh, Kiaro Sami's work. And there is uh, always the, the questioning of uh, something which can be called political or ethical, but for me, which uh, merges uh, ultimately and uh, about a sense of justice, uh, what's uh, fair, what, what should be done, how should people behave in a crisis situation, and uh, there are different uh, kind of crises. One of the most obvious one being uh, the, the, the earthquake, which is at the, the core of two of his major films, but also the relation towards life in the taste, uh, taste of sherry, uh, et cetera. And that uh, Kiarostami is constantly, and of course, the question of justice is in the center of uh, Close up, uh, which has been uh, aptly mentioned as a major film uh, uh, by, by Carlos Tami. Uh, and uh, the, the, what is the level of uh, acceptable or desirable kind of justice for a society is there uh, in, in the film, though it is never uh, described or used in an obvious way or in a direct way. Uh, Karastami is not a militant, he's not an activist. Uh, he would never like uh, uh, spread a an open discourse about the situation. But uh, one other way to think about that is about what is not in Karastami's film. When you have been traveling in Iran, as I've been doing extensively uh, uh, after 
1995. Uh, there are a lot of things you see all over the country, which you will never see in a Charles Tammy film. Now it's almost everywhere, and this is this has to do with uh, religion. It has to do with uh, the people who embody the power, who are never there in Charles Tammy cinema. Very, very, very almost ne 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 never there. He was looking at other people, and he was looking at them differently. He was paying attention. He was paying attention to the diversity of the country, and in Charles Tammy we go to many, many regions of, <laughs> of Iran. Uh, he's listening a lot to the different languages that are being spoken in Iran. Not everybody speaks Farsi or not only Farsi. And this is very present. And if we think of uh, uh, Taste of Sherry, uh, the encounters the main character does is uh, our encounters with different um, level in the society with uh, the, with a significant uh, attention to the poorest among 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 uh, Iranians, which is showing uh, that this is certainly not uh, a easy country to live for for everyone. But also is a uh, some someone from the. Uh, from, from, from different part of the, of, of the country with different uh, cultural background. So he's been portraying the country, depicting uh, the, the national complexities as a national, the, the, the many re relation uh, with uh, uh, the, the, the cultural uh, background. And obviously, um, uh, certain, a fair amount of what I'm saying that somebody explained it to me because it may be difficult to 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 acknowledge for for non-iranian for, for foreigners especially for someone like me who doesn't speak farsi but uh, it, it it is if if you start to, to pay attention you you become aware of the the diversity of uh, the the way he addresses uh, the, the language the costumes the landscapes the, the habits uh, and with some some small if, if you think of a film like choir short film called choir, called the, the choir it is addressing and and, and openly discussing uh, relations of power uh, and and uh, and behavior uh, and the misunderstanding inside society uh, or uh, lack of attention uh, to some part of the society by those who own uh, some some for, form of power. Of course, it's a small uh, children uh, story uh, with uh, the grandfather uh, holding the, the key of the house. It's not, it's not uh, addressing political issues openly, but it is dealing with this relation of powers, with the relation of uh, of what you believe in and what it means for you to, to believe in. And this is a very clear in where is my friend's house. You have to, to uh, uh, stick with your world and, and, and fight with powers. Uh, Ahmad, uh, the main character of, uh, of, uh, of the film is fighting with a lot of powers there in his level in his context, which is the family power, the grandfather, the mother, the father, uh, the, the, um, even the school teacher. Uh, but th this is political in one way. Uh, to, 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 it, politics is about power relations and the way uh, some, someone, even a small kid, has to uh, impose his own uh, beliefs and relation to life and to others through uh, difficulties uh, uh, which are coming from the social organization uh, he, he is part of. And so I think all of this is, uh, is very present in Carol Stanley's work uh, in, in very different ways. And it has to do, as it was already mentioned, of course, uh, with also his uh, belonging to a larger uh, cultural uh, embodiment of the of, uh, of the uh, Iranian uh, heritage. Uh, it it has 
Mehnat, Mehnat mentioned it uh, very appropriately, the, the importance of poetry, poetry is so central, uh, but I would stress maybe two, also two other dimensions, which one which is uh, uh, maybe not so obvious for Western eyes, but which has been uh, discussed quite extensively, which has to do with uh, Iranian visual art, especially what we call the miniature and how it does inspire uh, some ways of filmmaking, of, of directing. There are several uh, important texts about that, including from a Iranian uh, scholar who lives in France, who, who used to live in France, Youssef Fischarpour, uh, and also uh, the other dimension, which is telling a lot about his relation to his country, is uh, translated by uh, his photographic work. He's been uh, do, like recording the beauties of his country uh, through his photo work, uh, even more systematically, I would say that uh, with his films. <coughs> yeah. And one more thing, uh, Carlos Tami was not only an Iranian director, he was a director who wanted to work in Iran became rather difficult during the last years of his life as a, as a, as a, as a last part of his work. He insisted a lot in keeping, first staying in Iran. Many people told him it's difficult to bro in Iran and abroad you are uh, so respected and everybody admires you, you will be more than welcome. And he never thought of leaving Iran uh, as, a, as a place to live, uh, which was uh, very important for him. And, and also he tried a lot to make films, keep make, making films in Iran. It became too difficult at one point and two, his two last feature films are shot abroad outside of Iran, one in Italy and one in Japan. But there were films that were conceived for Iran. He could not manage to shoot there and he transformed them to a certain extent, uh, having to shoot them abroad. Uh, so this is also uh, because he, he was attacked uh, by a part of the Iranian society, society was very hostile. Uh, against him and uh, he could have just left, uh, several others did, uh, but he, 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 he remained there and he tried to do as much as he could and, and remained true to, he, he was very, very, he loved uh, Iran and the Iranian culture and people and landscape as well. Uh, and this translates in his work in many, in many ways. Hey, thank you. Uh, just to remind everybody who's listening in, if you have questions, please put them in the chat function. We'll be getting to them in a few minutes. Something that uh, both Mernaz and Jean-Michel touched upon that I perhaps will be our final question uh, is about another aspect of Kiristami I'd love to hear your thoughts on, and that is what you might say is spirituality. Uh, in a certain way, you know, the spiritual dimension of his work. Uh, a film that I love to teach and I teach quite often is The Wind Will Carry Us. And one of the things that really fascinated me when I was looking for articles and things on that was how many magazines that are devoted to specifically religious interests wrote about the film. And I'm not just talking, say, you know, I mean, Sufi magazines, Buddhist magazines, Jewish magazines, Christian all you know, usually wrote very positively about the film as a work of spiritual art, not just you know, a particular denomination, but one that really addressed spiritual issues. And I'm wondering, let me turn to you, Godfrey, if you have some thoughts about that spiritual dimension of Kiarostami's work. Well, let me try to reach that by going back to what we've been talking about, which is politics. Okay. Um, you know, when, when I went to that first festival that you staged in, uh, in, in New York, Richard, uh, in 1992, uh, you know, the question in the back of my mind uh, going into it was, uh, what are these films going to be like? Are they going to be political? And the first, you know, that was the first thought I had because I just thought it's coming from a very repressive society. Aren't they bound to be dissident? 
political films in some way. And then when I saw them, you know, there was hardly anything that would that fit that definition. I mean, uh, just really very distinctive uh, visions of these different directors of different aspects of Iranian society, some of them a little satiric or whatever, but not anything that seemed to me at all directly political. And when I started going to Iran and meeting these directors and talking to them about this, they, you know, they often said sort of the same thing. And Kiristami, Makhmabov, who are very, very different kinds of characters and artists, but they said that politics, just that was too narrow a subject and too superficial, that the things that they were interested in were deeper in the culture. They thought the problems that Iran had were sort of psychological, sociological uh, uh, complexes that went back very, very far in Iran's very ancient culture. And so that's what they were mainly interested in, in observing. And I think you can see that in some of the things that have just been mentioned, like where's the friend's house and the personal relationships, the power relationships and all of that. Uh, so I, I thought that that was very interesting and it, it, it made me think, well, this is not something that Iranian filmmakers are shying away from because the government would clamp down. I mean, the government did have very um, uh, you know, strict rules about um, what you can say and do regarding depicting the government and religious figures and all that sort of thing. But I don't think that the directors were, were, were afraid of that. They were looking for deeper subject matter. And uh, I think with Kiarostami, the more I got to know him, the more I saw that to me, all of his work seemed to be working on several levels at once. There was, uh, you could start with the documentary. I think he was interested in showing specific things as he you know, set out to make a film. But beyond that, there was the personal, the political, the philosophical, but all these things went together. And if it wouldn't have worked in the same way if you tried to be just directly uh, political, you know, uh, to me, the, the political and the philosophical and the personal were all all attached. And that's the way that, you know, we brought up the idea of poetry. I really think the more that I saw him, the more I talked to him, the more I looked at his work, the more I thought that his work was based or the, the greatest model for his work was poetry. Uh, it, it wasn't a matter of putting, you know, poems into his films. It was just like, the way that a poet goes about doing this, the assumptions that they have and such, both classical and, 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 and modern and trying to sort of find the way between those because Kiarostami was a very, very prolific poet himself, right? We, there's a great uh, translation of a lot of his poets that's like 900 pages long. Uh, and uh, I, I, you know, I don't read Farsi, but I've heard people that do say this poetry is really, really outstanding. But in terms of his filmmaking, I think that uh, he was thinking of film in, in, in terms of poetry, and that meant uh, being indirect, subtle, dealing with metaphor, dealing with uh, resonances and such. And so I thought that in the post-revolutionary period, uh, after uh, Where's the Friend's House, which was sort of the last film that he made before the world's attention really came down on him in a big way, after that, it seemed to me that a big subject that was coursing through a lot of these films was disappointment in the way that the revolution had turned out and the way that the revolution had produced a society that was so far uh, inferior to the dreams and the ideals that people had in, in launching the revolution. I mean, the, uh, you know, uh, where's, um, and life goes on is about the aftermath of the disaster. And if you take the earthquake as a metaphor for the uh, revolution, you can go a long way with that, right? And through the olive trees, there's this class difference thing that between the poor boy and the girl and all that, and the, you know, <laughs> come on, and you know, the fact that, um, you know, there is a society that hasn't given these people their dreams, right? That's what we're dealing with. And even going back before these films, close up, I think is very much about this, is a very much about the difference between these, you know, uh, suburban cinephiles and this poor guy that's obsessed with cinema that also speaks about a society that hasn't delivered on its taste of cherry is an interesting pivot. Where he's almost being, why does this man want to kill himself? Uh, is it, could it be that he's living in a 
society that he found, finds intolerable. Once again, the poetic thing is to leave that to the audience's own imagination and own intellect and dealing with. But uh, I, I think th this disappointment in the Islamic Republic is an undercurrent. And you know, when in getting to know him, he didn't talk too directly about politics too often. But I could get the sense of what he was thinking or saying in some of his indirect uh, comments. And he was not a happy camper about the Islamic Republic, but he also, as we were just talking about, didn't want to leave Iran, uh, didn't want to leave. I do think, though, that the fact that he made those two last uh, feature films outside of Iran after the uh, stolen election of Ahmadinejad, I mean, those were the two films that he made during the second Ahmadinejad uh, uh, you know, term. Uh, the fact that he went out of Iran to do that was, in a, in a way, a political statement. Uh, he didn't leave Iran in terms of not being a resident, I mean, not being a citizen who lived there, but he did go away from the country to make these films for, for various reasons. But I think there's a political dimension to that, too. But to come back to the spirituality, I think that, um, you know, it, it's, this is a really interesting question to me. I, I think it's, there's a spiritual dimension to all of his filmmaking uh, and, and, and yet it's complex and kind of ambivalent in that, you know, he grew up knowing all these great sort of spiritual poets like Hafez and Rumi, et cetera, et cetera. And I think he really respected and had a feeling for all of that. And yet he was more distant from it. He was kind of a, a spiritual skeptic who was deeply spiritual himself, but was not planning himself in any particular corner of the spiritual universe or identifying with any kind of creed or such. I, I think that mainly uh, his spirituality comes out in the poetry of what he's doing and in the personal feeling. And the more, this is the other thing, the more I got to know him and uh, look at his work, uh, I, the more I saw how personal these things, it's like every, almost every film is a self-portrait in a way and is talking about where he is at that point in his life. And in Taste of Cherry, he was, you know, maybe suicidal. I mean, he did talk about that, you know, at, at times and then uh, other films of uh, same thing. But I, I think you get a sense of his uh, spirituality in his, uh, in his poetic approach to his art. I do think though that this whole subject has not been sufficiently examined, discussed or whatever. And I say in my book, my one biggest regret in all these interviews that I did with him was that I didn't direct, I didn't uh, address that more directly and ask about the fact that he had a Sufi family. I mean, his family were, were Sufis, basically. His, his, his mom, his brother, who wrote the first short, uh, was a big Sufi. And uh, so this is a, a you know, a, um, place that he grew up in. He grew up surrounded by Sufism and not only reading the poets, but have it having it be in his family and such. And I, I, like I say, I don't think this has been examined uh, nearly enough. And it is a fascinating subject. You know, very interesting, Godfrey. And as I said, one of the things that struck me was how people from many different creeds, many different spiritual paths could really see or, and relate to in many ways, uh, the wind will carry us. You know, that seemed to be the film that really did speak to them on that issue. Right. Let me I, turn I, to I wrote an uh, article that is published by the Museum of Modern Art in a book that uh, yeah. is called the, the Hidden God. And that's yes. about the sort of a, the spiritual dimension of, of that, that particular film. Uh, I know that I think. Yeah. Uh, I, if I, I may, I think this spiritual dimension of Karastami, which is very true, has to do with his filmmaking and his relation toward reality. And, we spoke about Karastami mostly or even only uh, as his relation with Iran, which is uh, fair, which makes sense, but it also relates with other dimensions. And in this case, I would uh, mention uh, Rossellini, uh, the, the relation between reality and making a certain kind of image of reality which does come from Italian neorealism, and it was tr true and, uh, and uh, efficient to connect Chiarostami with this uh, tradition, with uh, this uh, storyline in, in the history of, of cinema. And uh, not any more than Rossellini has to be a religious person to direct Fioretti, 
which is one of the most spiritual film ever made uh, about uh, Francesco di Assisi, uh, he, as well as uh, the cinema of Kiarostami, thanks to the way he magnifies the presence of the real through the way he directs film, the fact that there is this notion that if you look at people and reality well enough, you can feel something bigger, something deeper, uh, was uh, at the core of this uh, of, of his cinema and translates maybe more obviously in The Wind Will Carry Us to a certain extent because it deals with uh, death, with uh, the, 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 some uh, metaphysical notion more, more directly, but it's there everywhere actually in his cinema. And this, this spirituality has to do with his filmmaking all the way through. Okay, I obviously would love to keep hearing your comments, but I'll hear more of them now in relationship to the many questions we've already gotten. So let me start. Uh, one question that I actually also had on my list that I want to bring up is the use of the car. Uh, it certainly is a kind of, uh, how could you say, a frequent device in Kiarostami's films and the Coker trilogy in Taste of Cherry, uh, Wind Will Carry Us, 10. I mean, cars are there. And in fact, one time when I was with Kiarostami, we were at an art show where someone had done something where they were projecting films onto a car. And he was so excited, he said, I have to do that. I have to do that. You know, he was going to do an, an installation where his own films were kind of projected from, from a car itself. But could any of you, would, who would like to perhaps address the use of cars in Kiarostami? Well, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, one of my most memorable experiences with him was he, I, I was doing these long interviews about these early films, and then he realized he had to go out of town. He had to go out of to, to, to Locarno in a couple of days. And he said, okay, I'm going to drive you up to Coker and I, we'll, we can talk all the way up there and all the way back. And that's what we did. We talked for like eight or 10 hours in, in, in a row driving there and back. But I just got in that experience how much he loved to drive. I mean, he really did. You know, I, I, I'm the opposite. I don't, I'm glad I don't have a car. I'm glad I live in New York. I don't need a car. I don't like to drive. Kiarostami was just the opposite. He he took great relish in driving. I think he really, really enjoyed it. And he felt like, you know, you could also see him looking all the time, like a photographer would look for a subject. I mean, he was always sort of exploring the world through through driving through it. But I think the other thing I would just say very briefly is it's often brought up is for Iranian filmmakers, a car has a real advantage in that you can have it's sort of like indoors and outdoors at the same time. You know, after the revolution, uh, Kiarostami, Nadari, and some others just wouldn't make films about adults, uh, you know, in married situations, because in reality, Iranian women indoors at home won't have their scarves on. But the uh, rules decreed that they had to. So that's why Kiarostami and Nadari and others said that they started making films about kids, but also why they started using cars, because in a car, you have a private situation but the, the person would, would have their scarf on because they're in public at the same way. They can be seen from outside. And I, I think that's a, a key, key factor in all of this. I mean, it's often been cited as a, as a big factor, and it certainly worked for Kiarostami, too. But the car was, a, at the same time, it was a thinking machine for him and a cinematic machine, like a, a strange version of a camera uh, actually and he he spent a lot of time as 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 uh, got fred uh, appropriately uh, mentioned uh, in the car and he enjoyed it but he he used to say this is where i work best this is where i think about my films and i uh, build uh, the, the, the the project so it was not only enjoying uh, the experience of drawing per se but it was <coughs> It was also uh, a discovering ways to uh, connect things together with landscapes, with uh, <coughs> also discussion inside the, the car. And of course, there is this famous film called Ten, which is completely inside the car as a extreme uh, situation. He would use uh, pretty pretty often before. So the the car has to do with a with cinema as a 
apparatus uh, for him uh, that was that was very very uh, productive uh, during during all these all these years, also for the reason already told. Yeah. I also want to add a couple of uh, comments. I completely agree with the other two uh, uh, speakers that you know uh, the uh, the car also gave him the opportunity uh, for. Uh, so for his surrogate, you know, sort of representation, you know, the actors in the film that stands for him, obviously, that uh, we don't know where he comes from and where he's going. So uh, that idea that, you know, uh, 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 he, he has to ask for direction and he has to include roads and he has to, you know, so that, you know, that really, you know, maybe intentionally or unintentionally, it has become, you know, his, uh, Part of his pictorial palette that you know the roads become uh, a sort of a visual representation of you know what he is in you know, his philosophy. Also the movement of the car and of course car. You know modern times we spend most of our lives in a car. You know so that, that sort of that transitional you know idea of car. But you know mainly the fact that you know uh, in a lot of his film you know the, the car stops. We will ask for direction. And you know, you come at some point say, okay, just stop. You know, I got it. You know, it's almost humorous too. But the idea of you know direction, idea of you know the past, the idea of not, not you know, and he you know once he told me that you know, my film are all about the middle. There is no beginning. There is no end. It's just the middle. And you know, the car sort of captures that. You know, we don't know where the character is coming and where it's going. So anyway. <laughs> Okay, another question we had tries to put uh, Kiristami perhaps in a more international context. And this question, Jean-Michel, you already spoke about Italian neorealism, but wondered about the impact maybe of the French New Wave and also of Japanese cinema. I know that Kiristami was a great admirer of Japanese cinema. Could any of you, all of you, please perhaps respond to that? And maybe I'll just bring it out and say, talk about Kiaristani in terms of just contemporary cinema in general. Well, one thing I think we should uh, acknowledge is that he was not and never pretended to be a great cinephile or having a huge uh, cinema culture. And he would also, uh, well, he, he would, he would accept if, if journalists or, or, or critics when they interview director, they say, oh, but I compare your film with this director. He would say, okay, great, what a good <laughs> idea. But actually, uh, he would, he would, it wouldn't uh, lead uh, very well. The, the, I see there is a question uh, about the influence of uh, Jean-Luc Godard. Uh, I'm not very sure how much of Godard films uh, Karostami ever watched. And, uh, and at least uh, in the first decades of his uh, activity as a filmmaker, uh, I don't think he, he knew so much about Godard, or at least that, he, that it was important for, for him. His uh, way of filmmaking came from, it, if it has influence, it's mostly from uh, uh, the Iranian uh, so-called uh, new, new wave, uh, much more than from uh, from uh, a broad cinema. There will be a specific uh, exception. One, there are several. One major specific exception would be not Japanese cinema, but Ozu, uh, Ozu films. Uh, he he would. I'm not sure exactly when he started to discover uh, Ozu for real. Probably, I would say, it's after having have been told by foreign critics that there are common uh, elements between his work and Ozu that he finally got there and he went to Japan quite often. Uh, he was uh, extensively in Japan He would, uh, and he loved the Japanese uh, um, culture at, at large so he had, uh, could relate with, with that and he, he was also uh, interested in others. I remember at extraordinary conversation between him and uh, Oshima uh, in Kyoto uh, that was uh, pretty much amazing. Also amazing in the sense that they don't have much in common, ultimately. Uh, they respected each, uh, each other very much. They appreciated on a human level a lot each other, but 
uh, I think it would be wrong to pretend to connect everything with everything all the time. He had to do with Ozu. He was there in Tokyo for the centennial of uh, the birth of Ozu, and he made a very beautiful speech on this occasion with a deep affinity with uh, Ozu cinema. Uh, and I believe if you know a little bit about Ozu, it's quite easy to understand why on many, many, many levels of relation towards reality, about ways to address large questions into uh, small situations or a common situation, and, uh, and, and also the elegance of the composition of the frame and so on, so, so, so many things. So um, probably uh, Rossellini in one direction and, uh, and uh, Ozu in another uh, are among the few real uh, connections that deserve to, to, to be made. He, he knew about 400 blows and he would care for it because also because it's children and everything. But I, I think it's a bit pointless to uh, try to push uh, more than there is. Uh, Jarostami created his own style. He had a few uh, input from uh, the, the rest of the history of cinema. Most of the input comes from elsewhere, as it has been said, poetry and uh, visual art and Iranian culture at large. And I'd say this is it. Yeah, I, I also don't think that, you know, he is a new realist filmmaker, although he, he, you know, he may have, you know, had some, you know, uh, inspiration, you know, they in, inspired him in some ways, maybe. He has also been, you know, uh, compared to Tati in terms of Jacques Tati, in terms of the forms that creates that kind of, you know, the commentary on social order and also, you know, a sense of, you know, humor too. That, but, you know, I think that, you know, one thing that, you know, uh, it's important about him that, you know, uh, with all the references that one could make with other cinemas, international cinemas, is that one thing that makes him a modernist filmmaker is that idea of self-criticism as a media maker in his film, constantly, you know, uh, from traveler onwards to, you know, uh, wind wheel carriers, that the person who is uh, the media maker is the center of criticism. And that sense of self-criticism is a very important element that is, uh, you know, I think I want to just under. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention two, uh names that have to do with the 1990s and uh, maybe somewhat oblique, but the other director that uh, was greatly favored by a lot of American critics during the 1990s was Ho Shao Shen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to, I, I think I'm the unusual American critic in having spent time during that era in both Taipei and Tehran. And I sort of took messages back and forth between the two of them, which were mainly just expressions of admiration and appreciation. I do think that you can see, a, a, I totally agree with what Jean-Michel said about Rossellini and Ozu being sort of the most you know, important perhaps connections in some way, but you can see the, the influence of Ozu on both of them. Um, but uh, I, I think that they both appreciated what each other were doing, whether they were watching their films much or not, I don't know. But the other one was uh, more amusing, I think, Quentin Tarantino. Uh, you know, he, he and uh, Abbas got to be friends on the festival circuit during the year of Pulp Fiction and uh, Through the Olive Trees. And I always thought that was really amusing to think about that, them sitting around the swimming pool, uh, tossing the stories back and forth. But uh, it also occurred to me, I did an interview, a uh, QA, and a a couple of weeks ago with an Iran young Iranian director named Sharam Mokri, who, um, his film, his latest film, Careless Crime, has this sort of surprisingly upbeat ending when you're expecting something much, much worse. And it's very similar in a way to uh, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And I, in fact, other Tarantino films where the endings are much more you know, positive in some ways than, the, than what led up to them. Uh, and he said, oh yeah, yeah Tarantino is definitely an influence on me. So I thought that this connection between Tarantino, the least likely, person you would ever think to be connect with Abbas Kiarostami. And, uh, and uh, 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 Kiarostami is pretty, pretty funny. Jackie, you stole one of the I, stories I wanted to share. Oh, my no. God. I'm sorry. But, all right. No, it's OK. You have as much right to advise me. Yeah, not, I always thought that was one of the more amusing relationships. But they were really a mutual admiration society. They were, yeah. spoke really highly of each other, which was nice. Well, he, 
Abbas really liked Keir, uh, Clinton as a person very much. I mean, they, they, they were like, yeah. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to just, just to add to what Judge Press said uh, that they were both at uh, Ozu Centennial, Husha oh, Ocean, really? <laughs> Husha Ocean and, and Carol's time. Oh, I, I got you, yeah. yeah. That's great. Let me, uh, we have to sort of end soon, but let me ask by throwing out the question that many people have asked. Will each of you talk about what your favorite Kiarostami film is and why? John michel I'll start again with you. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is this is this is so 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 difficult. Uh, uh, we, we've already mentioned the masterpieces by Kiarostami, and I totally uh, share what have been said. But if uh, if uh, I would I would answer with the bread and the alley, his, his first short film, uh, because it is absolutely amazing. He knows almost nothing about directing. Uh, he. Uh, it, it has been said that he had freedom to express his, himself uh, thanks to being part of Canoon, which was right. But at the same time, he was working with film technicians who thought they knew better than him and he imposed every idea he had against them. And he fought already for his vision and he, the way to walk, to look at the kid, to look at the dog, to look at the street, to uh, pay attention to the light in the street, to the noises, to uh, the, the, and it is a quite cruel film. There is a lot of cruelty in, in Charles time in cinema, as well as there are so much good feelings and uh, and uh, and uh, caring for, for for the others and in this very small film so simple apparently most of what he's going to do all his life is there or can be traced retrospectively obviously uh, and so it is a way to escape the question of maybe but it is also true that i do i do care a lot for for, for this film close up remains the great theoretical object and uh, and emotional as well because Sajian is very moving in his way, but uh, uh, my answer is the bread and the alley. Okay, Mirnaz. Well, definitely the close up for me, you know, uh, in so many ways, understanding the culture of Iranian uh, at the time and uh, interpreters of cinema in Iran at the time, you know. The way that he has done it, you know, absolutely uh, close up, you know, uh, is you know, uh, is my favorite. But it's very hard to pick up, you know, a favorite because there are so many different uh, films of his that I really, really love. Uh, uh, of his short films, I love orderly and disorderly a lot. You know, I'm crazy about that film. <laughs> okay, and Godfrey. Well, as a Gemini, I can't choose just one. I have to have two. Uh, so uh, it's really the, the films that sort of book in the 1990s, which is his great decade. Uh, it's close up at the beginning and The Wind Will Carry Us at the end. Those are definitely my two favorite of his films. And I think they're sort of complementary in some strange way. Uh, they're the beginning and the end of a, an amazing journey on his part. I do, you know, I'm often... Uh, in talking about Iranian cinema, but or in, in introducing people to Kiarostami, say it's good to start with certain films. If people out there have not been exposed to much of his work, I re always recommend starting with Close Up and the Coker Trilogy, because I think those are really very accessible films with really fascinating films and beautiful films that kind of draw the viewer in. And once you have sort of like have absorbed those and become you know seduced by those then you can go on to some of the ones that are maybe seem more difficult and have an easier time with them. So that's my little bit of advice for, for anybody that might be looking for recommendations about how to approach Karastami. Well, I, I also, it's tough to choose between them, but I, I do have a extraordinary place in my heart for The Wind Will Carry Us. And uh, in fact, when I was, so after I had seen it and I was talking to Abbas about it, gushing and gushing about how much I loved it. He looked at me and I've always wondered what he meant by this. He said, I think you're right. I don't think I have to make any more films. <laughs> anyway, well, he did go on to make more films, but uh, anyway, I'll just uh, end our discussion with that. 
Thank you all uh, very much. I think we have to, we were told that we must end this by 3.30. So uh, again, I'll thank Jean-Michel and Mernaz and Godfrey very, very much. And of course, the Georgetown Persian Studies Program for making this event possible. Thank you. Janab, do you want to come back? <laughs> I am back. Yes, uh, thank you to all of our panelists for a very rich, dialogue and great contribution to preserving Kiara Stami's monumental legacy. This webinar was recorded and will be accessible on our website, which is Georgetown University Persian Studies Program. And to conclude, I decided that there is no better way to end this than with Kiara Stami's very own words. And one of my favorite quotes, which I'll share with you. Kiarostami says, in order to be universal, you have to be rooted in your own culture. And with that, I wanna thank all of our panelists for a very rich dialogue, as well as the many participants that we had who joined from all around the world. Thank you for being with us. And we hope to see you at our upcoming events in the future. Kodanagam and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.